Good morning, everyone. I am Mary Sue Moreau, Director of Michigan Works Northeast Consortium, and I would like to welcome you to today's Inside Politics panel discussion. Before we begin our discussion, let me introduce our panel members. Peter Riddell is a partner and co-leader of the Governor Relations and Regulatory Practice Group in Hahnemann. He is an accomplished attorney and government relations advisor with more than two decades of experience around state government, public policy, and elections. Peter is widely recognized for his experience in representing clients with their health, insurance, education, and budget issues. Among his many legislative accomplishments, he is highly regarded for his work in passing the Dr. Ron Davis smoke-free air law, which made all Michigan restaurants, bars, and work sites smoke-free. He is sought after for his advice and guidance on complicated regulatory and legislative issues. The Speaker of the House appointed Peter as his representative to the 21st Century Education Commission. Chris Andreessen serves as a Senior Vice President at DECO GR Team. He works extensively with clients to identify policy opportunities and threats to create detailed legislative and executive strategies. His broad experience includes working with companies, universities, nonprofits, and trade associations in the following sectors workforce development, consumer products, manufacturing, retail, biotechnology, renewable energy, criminal justice, mental health, technology, and higher education. Chris frequently presents to corporate board of directors on the overall state of Congress and the administration, focusing on the impact their actions have on business activities and decisions. Chad Leitengood is the Senior Editor for Politics, Policy, and Detroit Rising for Crane's Detroit Business. In this position, he covers the intersection of business and public policy in Michigan and Detroit back on the rise after decades of economic, social, and political decline for Michigan's leading business news publication. His focus is writing about the people, institutions, and ideas that will be vital to returning a middle class to the poorest big city in America. Chad worked as a reporter for the Jackson Citizen Patriot, Springfield Newsletter, the News Journal, and the Detroit News before joining Crane's Detroit Business. Let's start today's discussion with a question for Chris. Michigan, as well as states all across the nation, are waiting on federal lawmakers to see if there will be any money included in a second COVID relief package to help balance the budget for the upcoming fiscal year. With the presidential election on the horizon, how likely do you think it is that a COVID relief package will materialize? And what is the likelihood of there being money in it for the states? Thanks, Mary Sue, and, and great to be with everybody. Unfortunately, you know, I don't have good news today from, from Washington. Um, I would say, you know, just more directly to the question, Mary Sue, I think it's unlikely at this point that we're going to get a, an additional COVID relief package from Congress. You mentioned we're right now, quite frankly, we're just too too close to the to the presidential election at this point. Um, what's really what's really uh, slowed slowed the progress down is that you know you've had this period of time where you, know, you had the cares act which passed in, in late march and you go back to then and you know it seems like things are different although that they're a little bit the same i mean the but you look at where the stock market was on that particular day it would it had been down like 25 percent obviously unemployment job losses were happening at a much more rapid pace than they are today and and some of those factors really kind of um, were a catalyst to Congress acting so quickly back at the end of March. You know, since that time, the House has passed essentially a partisan bill, that the HEROES Act, uh, which had, you know, 900 plus billion dollars for state and local governments included in it. Um, you know, the Senate Republicans from, you know, essentially the day after the HEROES Act passed and leading up to it said, hey, we're not going to do anything on this until after July 4th. And that didn't turn out to seeing their proposal until July 27th. And so I think we lost a lot of time. Uh, and of course, the recent proposals from Re Senate Republicans have included zero uh, dollars in new money for state and local governments, which makes it hard to negotiate when you're coming in at 900 plus billion dollars on the Democratic side and zero from the Republican side. 
Um, now, I think that they made a little bit of progress in terms of offering more. Uh, you know, there, there was $150 billion for state and local governments in the CARES Act. Not all of that has been spent. That's been kind of a talking point for the Republicans here. Um, bottom line is, as I said, I, I believe that it's unlikely we'll get another package if, if there is by some, and I think right now it would take a miracle for this to get passed before the election. Um, the, the state and local funding aspect would have to be a key piece to that for the Democrats to actually um, agree to something. So, uh, you know, absent, absent that miracle, that Hail Mary, uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't look like we're going to get any additional relief for, you know, whether it's state and local governments, businesses, um, you know, or quite frankly, job seekers and, and individuals and families in Michigan or anywhere else before, before this election. Thanks, Chris. And uh, that is unfortunate. COVID relief is unlikely. So while we're on the topic of state budgets, question for Peter Riddell. Peter, we are hearing there's an estimated $284 million budget deficit for the 2021 state budget. If we don't get dollars from the federal government to help balance the budget, how is that hole going to be filled? Uh, well, until Chris spoke, we were all planning on Trump bucks uh, finding their way back to Michigan. But uh, now I guess that's not going to be possible. I guess we're not going to join. Uh, seriously, the, the legislature just reached a target agreement last night. Uh, they're, they're planning a $250 million uh, cut in spending over the last fiscal year. So that's essentially where we're going to see the reductions. We expect to see the reductions hit um, uh, DHHS, the, the uh, health side, and corrections, the largest. The target agreement called for uh, flat funding for the Per People Foundation for K-12. That's the only item, and I take that back, and also revenue sharing for local governments. It's the only two items that the target agreement mentioned specifically that they were not going to touch. Uh, now the cuts have been sent to appropriate uh, subcommittees for the subcommittee chairs to begin their negotiations with the expectation that the budget will be adopted next week. We have had multiple conversations throughout the summer with most of our key appropriators. Uh, there is growing uh, optimism from my perspective on going pro funding uh, at a small amount being included Although it was not part of the target agreement, it is something that is universally uh, lauded as one of the major economic development tools for the state. So that's one item that we're going to continue to, to track and lobby for in the next week as we talk to the, the conferees and the subcommittee, uh, subcommittee chairs. Okay, thanks. And we did have a quick follow-up question, but you've um, answered and talk about the going pro talent front is an important resource for employers. And so I'm glad that you brought that up because that is definitely important for um, our employers uh, across the state to fund on the job training for both new and existing employees. So um, we look forward well, to you know, I, I'll just expand on that just a little bit if I can, Mary Sue. So, you know, we, we have talked, you know, the, you know the, we've talked to Senator Horn repeatedly. We've talked to Leo and MEDC repeatedly all of whom are fully in support of going pro, in addition to our, our House subcommittee chair, um, um, Representative Representative Heisinga. Uh, so we think there is broad support for it. And, you know, I think that last year we were collateral damage in a political fight in terms of what happened to going pro. And based on where we have a, a, a leadership agreement with the governor and the legislative leaders. We, we don't expect that kind of political collateral damage to occur this budget cycle. Thanks, Peter. The next question is for Chad. So you recently wrote an opinion about the 2.8 billion that is sitting in school accounts and how it could help the state with its budget shortfalls. Can you tell us about this and if it is something that could seriously be considered? Well, it's a little uh, outdated already because um, the legislature or the, the, the revenue estimating conference in August concluded there wasn't 
the kind of deficit, a uh, billion dollars uh, de- that originally was projected. It's the, the revenue to come back, partly because <clears throat> of a, a whole host of factors, the stimulus programs in particular uh, kind of kept uh, spending uh, going and income uh, coming in and people paying income taxes, and then they paid their income taxes in July after the extension. Uh, so um, so the, the immediate crisis, uh, the bubble has been burst on that. But long term, you know, the governor just recently said that Michigan is his economy is back to 87 percent. I'm not exactly sure where she came up with that number, but um, um, let's just say that that's that's accurate. Well, the last 13 percent of the economy re- recovering that is probably going to be pretty, pretty hard to to do so. And so uh, long term, there's going to have to be some real um, um, uh, reality checks in Lansing about uh, the ability to finance schools. Uh, Mipsers, the pension fund, is continuing to suck more and more money out of of school aid every year. Um, And I've kind of been advocating for uh, essentially that, that, you know, lawmakers have got to start thinking about long-term uh, viability. Um, the, these school districts cannot go on with like 2% growth over a decade. That's just not viable. And with more and more of the money we having coming out of their hide basically over the last decade for the pensions, uh, that's just less money that's going to the classrooms. Um, and so um, just because uh, they, they kind of you know screwed by here in the next week or so without actually facing a, uh, down a deficit, doesn't mean there's not another one around the corner. And and uh, and so, you know, there are a host of, of proposals out there, whether it is um, um, uh, refinancing the, 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 uh, the payments they make to the pension uh, fund so that they're not on this uh, uh, sp- sped up schedule that uh, the former governor, Rick Snyder, advocated for. You might have heard him once or twice say that 2038 would be a great year to be governor because the state would be debt free. Well, that's if we stick to this very, you know, uh, aggressive schedule of paying down the pension um, uh, debt uh, of the state for 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 educators and and school employees. And there are some that would say that maybe it would be best to refinance that, push that out like you would your mortgage, uh, rather than twenty years, push it out thirty years, actually eighteen years. I mean, so it's it's a pretty aggressive um, uh, timeline. Um, and then at the same time. I think this is going to come up in the debate here pretty soon. Uh, you know, we still have to wrestle with the fact that we have um, a system of schools that was built for about 2 million kids. And we've got about 1.5 million kids uh, in, the, in those schools. And we actually have more school administration than ever before um, because of, of the expansion of charter schools uh, in the last 20 years. And so, we have a lot of school infrastructure to service, and we have a, a dwindling pot of money to pay for it. Thanks, Chad. And I think that what you're saying of things changing quickly is, is very true in, in our uh, current economy. So let's go back to Chris for the next question. Chris, as election day draws closer, and you kind of touched a little bit on this, how does the general state of politics impact workforce development policy? Yeah, it's in speaking of Chad mentioned reality checks, we need a few of those in DC too. Um, we, we just don't do very well with staring down debts and deficits um, and, and thinking long term. But I think, you know, the reality is that the, the presidential election, the proximity to it right now is the factor that's holding everything up. Right. And I think, you know, you can, you could go back a few weeks or, or a month or so and look to see perhaps where the, where the polls have, have twisted and turned a little bit. Um, you know, obviously looking ahead, um, there's a few different scenarios, um, but, but, but the White House and the Senate are, are very much in play for, for Democrats to, to take control. Um, you know, you re- we really can't know exactly where this goes. My my personal feeling is that the the presidential election is a lot closer than than any of us really know. Um, certainly, you know, Joe Biden is a much different candidate than say uh, Hillary Clinton was in 20, 2016, and and the path to victory for Donald Trump is very narrow in terms of sweeping through the Midwest again. Um, 
that's almost like a unicorn. So, you know, speaking of the, the unicorns and Peter's background, I mean, how many time, how many can you find? Um, so that, that rests with this question of, okay, how much money getting back to the debt and deficit question, which it's, it's a realistic question, right? Um, here, I've always, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of likened that to the boogeyman. No one's ever seen it, but everyone's really afraid of it. Uh, when you talk about debts and deficits, and so, you know, thinking from the Democratic perspective, if they if they feel that they have a really good chance of perhaps taking the Senate and then also winning the White House and while maintaining control of the House, from their perspective, you know, they could hold this, you know, whatever it en would end up being, you know, one and a half, two, two and a half, three trillion dollars um, that would potentially right now give a boost to President Trump um, and the economy. Or they can hold that for when they feel maybe they have control and do a much larger program, much like we saw in 2009 during the recovery, uh, you know, the, the Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARA dollars. And obviously the, the workforce system benefited greatly from that effort uh, in the Obama-Biden administration. And, you know, certainly when you look at that, that's a possibility. Um, you know, infrastructure is something that that is talked about quite a bit here, you know, the House passed a $1.5 trillion infrastructure bill uh, just a few weeks ago here in DC. Um, that, that isn't ultimately going anywhere, but, but those are the types of considerations, Mary Sue, that, that really drive, okay, is there gonna be a second, you know, a, another large COVID relief package or not? And understanding the dynamics there, the politics involved, um, that has really, really slowed everything to a halt because everyone's trying to do those various scenarios, you know, whether whether the president gets reelected or not, whether the Democrats can take the Senate or not. You know, again, from from my perspective where I said, I think the presidential race is, is very close. Um, you know, the Senate races that, that are in play and certainly Senator Peters in Michigan um, is is one of the one of the vulnerable Democrats. There aren't very many. Uh, there's one in Alabama, Doug Jones, that that seat will likely turn back to the Republicans. Um, you know, Senator Peters, I would say, you know, today is, is it an okay spot, but it's still, you know, still pretty early. And then you've got several other races um, where you have vulnerable Republican members. And so if the Democrats kind of see those things breaking their way, they may say strategically, you know, why, why pass this bill now when, you know, come January, we're going to have control of White House, Senate and House, and we can perhaps dictate a little bit more about you know, thinking about state and local funding, some of their priorities, why would we negotiate on that now when we think we'll be in a stronger position in a few months? Um, so it has an enormous impact, Mary Sue. Uh, we are following that obviously very closely, but that's that's really what, you know, I think a shame in terms of some of the negotiating we've seen recently is the House passed the HEROES Act on May 15th. If you had done some of this back in, you know, the end of May, sometime in June, I think it's a possibility you could have had another sort of package materialize. But once you got into August and September, getting so close to the election, it just made it much more unlikely that, that things would move forward. Thank you, Chris. That's very interesting. So we'll stay tuned for November to see what's in very interesting um, informational. So now let's turn back to Chad for the next question. Chad, while we don't know just yet what the past COVID economy is going to look like, we do know there will be a lot of people who no longer have jobs due to business closures. Those individuals are going to need to reskill and retrain for different jobs on most likely a completely different career path. What employment trends are you seeing that will be in demand post COVID? Well, I think uh, we, we, we're definitely going to need more information workers. We already know that. Uh, we know that from the demand. We also know that uh, there are um, shifts in retail, um, that uh, tr tr traditional retail is, is eroding still, and um, except unless you're a grocer and you obviously uh, can't find enough people to fill, uh, fill your stores, um, or you can't find enough people to walk around your stores and shop for someone else, which you see a lot of that. Uh, uh, we've shipped and all the other uh, delivery services now. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, the Amazons of the world are, are hiring. Um, they're, they're looking for a couple thousand people right now, basically in Metro Detroit. 
Um, but I think some of the other areas that we were short on before, we're going to we continue to be short on uh, in healthcare. Um, hospitals uh, are 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 in recruiting, uh, you know, um, uh, competitions right now. I, I have a friend who um, took a, a who's a nurse practitioner who took a, a job for sixty dollars an hour at, at a hospital in Metro Detroit, uh, about about another fifty miles from her house, um, because they were going to pay fifteen dollars an hour more uh, than. Uh, her other hospital. Uh, I mean, talk about uh, bidding wars essentially right now for for essential workers. And so, uh, healthcare trained in particular, skilled healthcare remains uh, you know highly sought after positions, and there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, there's still a lot of opportunities in advanced manufacturing that are going on, and we we see that with some of the resurgence of of uh, auto manufacturing. Uh, within Metro Detroit, um, the the big uh, project that Fiat Chrysler has right now, where they're about to uh, open their new auto plant uh, in Detroit, along with uh, uh, renovating uh, and expanding their Warren truck plant. Uh, these are these are are good assembly jobs, but there's a lot of other skilled crafts they're looking for every day, and um, and there's and there's still not enough for that. I mean. They had to bring a lot of them of skilled trades workers from out of state um, uh, uh, who left during the shut shutdown in the spring from from COVID nineteen and now are uh, now have actually returned from other states to fill the uh, the gaps and needs uh, in those workforces um, uh, and then there's there's uh, there's a lot of information technology jobs out there that uh, before the before the pandemic um, companies were not having very good success filling those jobs. Uh, and so I think that there is a um, still a broader need for for both, um, but certainly um, um, we, we know that uh, the, the more education that you have, the, the, the more potential um, career opportunities there are. And, 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 and we, we can see that from, from our competition for jobs, um, uh, just with our, some of our big companies too, who are sometimes struggling a big three Quicken Loans, uh, they 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 are they are looking for people uh, with minds and, and the ability and the talents and skill sets, uh, specific skill sets. Um, I mean, Quicken and, and United Shore have added thousands of jobs this year. Uh, mortgage industry is having a very very good year, uh, as you might have noticed with Quicken Loans going public um, a couple months ago or a month ago. And so, I think those are those are some of the broader areas we got to kind of focus on. Thanks, Chad. Great insight on that. And it's definitely true that the jobs are changing and we need training dollars to um, help fill those positions. So this next question is for the entire panel. So I'll just start with um, um, if Peter wants to go first. So from each of your perspectives, what long-term impacts do you see the COVID crisis having on both the economy and the economy? That, that's a fantastic question, right? I think it's still a little bit too early to see, but I think there's going to be massive disruption in both. Um, and, and I would and I would broaden workforce development to include the entire education spectrum. Right? We've got a question in the queue about reconnect, which I may address uh, right now too. But right, I think we're going to have massive disruption. Right? Chad alluded to right, a, a student population at two million two million students, which is where we were based in the 1950s. Right? We're down to one point. 5 million today. I think the projections are over the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to get down to 1.2 million K through 12 students. So, you know, the capacity is just too large for our student population. And, right, okay, we all have our own personal experiences in, in how COVID has affected our, our respective families in the K 12 system. Um, you know, I've got one child who's thriving at home, right, has no desire to ever go back to school, is able to see her friends and do everything online. And I've got one child who it, it has to get in school, otherwise she does not thrive. So I have a feeling that we're going to see families like mine that are going to are going to change the way that we have uh, acquired education services. And I think the same thing is going to translate throughout the entire workforce development system and the entire post-secondary education system. So I, I just think we don't know yet how disruptive this can and will be. Uh, the, the the question on reconnect, however, is 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 a good one, right? The, in in May, I think, 
the legislature passed two bills to codify the Michigan Reconnect program, which was one of the governor's signature programs from last year. They, they've now funded the program. And the question is still out there whether there will be any funds attributed to the program through this current budget cycle. Governor, as, as I think most people on this group will know, in this, this chat will know, um, uh, announced her Futures for Frontliners program using some CARES Act dollars. So one of the questions is whether the legislature will, will allow additional funds to flow into a signature program for the governor. And I think if you, you, you know, if you get into the political debate on that, I think the answer is unlikely. And it was not a topic, uh, to my understanding, of, of the target negotiations. So I think this is something that, that the department, particularly Leo and Jeff down three are gonna have to advocate very hard for. And I think they're gonna, they're gonna see some reticent voices in the legislature. The legislature's top two priorities in the economic development budget are number one, Pure Michigan, right? The advertising campaign for tourism. And number two is going pro. So I think those are the top two you know, programmatic desires of the legislature. Reconnect doesn't make that list. Um, I didn't, so that's that's answering that question in the queue after I uh, tried to dribble on a little bit about how disruption is is really still too too new to know what what's going to happen. Okay, thanks, Peter. And um, yes, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat. And if we have time, we'll get to those at the end. Um, Chris, um, same question. Um, I I think the the impact from this is probably you know wider, deeper, and longer than than we know today. To, to Peter's point, um, I think about back you know on the workforce from the workforce development lens. You know, I think back to you know December, January, February when we were still in the midst of a really booming and strong economy. So we thought, um, but it seems to me that that the the vulnerable populations that we were worried about, you know, at the beginning of this year when the economy was really good, um, are are much more vulnerable and and have we have a whole new generation of people to me that could be left out of this recovery. I mean, a lot of the jobs that Chad was talking about. In terms of some of these companies hiring, um, you think of an emphasis on digital skills, digital digital literacy, access to to broadband internet, to be able to do some of these things from home in this you know sort of post COVID world. And the reality is, we know that that those vulnerable populations, those less fortunate, low income, low skill workers and individuals in Michigan, are going to have a much more difficult time either reconnecting with with the economy or just getting back on to try and take advantage of some of those opportunities that Chad said. I mean, in, in DC, um, and, I, and I think obviously in Michigan too and across the country, this is a moment for workforce development, um, right? I mean, we for, for the last several years, we've been talking about issues that companies had with the, uh, you know, with the, with the skills gap, which is, which is always there, but not having enough talent out there now, of course, with these massive unemployment numbers, you've got, you know, potentially new workers. The question is, are they, are they, uh, do they have the right skills and training to, to take advantage of some of those opportunities that, that Chad mentioned? Um, and, and again, as workforce development professionals, your, your jobs have changed, right? Not only, you know, technically day to day in terms of providing virtual versus in-person services, but also, you know, the, the demands from the employers, um, you know, the, the available talent in, in your respective areas. Um, I think back to the Paycheck Protection Program, which obviously came to us through the CARES Act, and you know, having you know, worked with, with everybody across Michigan, that was a massive layoff aversion program, right? It was $670 billion from the federal government um, in, in layoff aversion, and I was talking to folks, whether it was in the administration or Congress, about some of the you know, strategies that, that we've used on layoff aversion, you know, still today through the pandemic before um and and especially thinking to you know some of those hiring announcements you know the amazons of the world fiat chrysler those large companies you you look at you know how well target walmart some of the the big retailers can do because they have the infrastructure and the and the bandwidth and the wherewithal to you know push customers to an e-commerce um platform or channel but to me, it really comes down to those small businesses um, where, where really the Michigan work system provides so much value um, because 
that person who may be the CEO of their company may be also an answering the phones. They don't have an HR department. They don't know. They can't forecast um, what their financials, what their talent needs are going to be. That to me is where the workforce development system and Mystery Works really makes a, a, a significant impact. Um, and you know, the reality is, I think again, we've already seen, unfortunately, a lot of those small businesses aren't coming back. You know, those jobs are not coming back. You know, initially when we when we talked to the administration, when, when unemployment was just rising so so quickly, there was some hope. I think that you know they were saying about seventy five to eighty percent of their respondents were saying that those layoffs were temporary. I think what we're seeing as this goes on is that some of those layoffs are becoming permanent. And so what do you do with those individuals um, who may not have the right skills for these, for these next jobs? We got to get them into connected to something, whether it's training or education, something through, uh, through the, the system. Um, and again, this is all under a cloud of uncertainty. I mean, God forbid there's another shutdown or a, a surge in cases that, you know, we've been sort of led to believe is going to happen in the, in the coming months over this, you know, fall winter time period, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps the paycheck protection program and that those federal funds were able to save, you know, millions of businesses the first time, the question is going to be what happens the next time around. And, and certainly, you know, Chad and Peter have alluded to it, you know, at the state side, you may be able to, and it's, it's difficult in politics in general, but looking more proactively long-term, is just so difficult and and you know the point that we've been trying to make to you know the the federal delegation i know that, that peter and chad make these connections too is we can't be in a situation again where we have a shutdown or something happens and, and we haven't funded workforce development the workforce development system because then you know you're 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 trying to fight a battle without any resources and then you're kind of stuck in a, in a bad position so I, I'm a firm believer that our that our economy is is fundamentally changed from this, especially when you think about conventions like this and and big gatherings when you're when you're at a hotel and a conference and exchanging ideas. I love that setting. Um, that's been put on pause. I mean, Peter mentioned tourism is such a huge part to Michigan's revenues, but other states across the country, that that seems to me to be one of those areas that's going to be you know maybe longer to come back you know, restaurants, I mean, some of these things. And so that has a trickle down effect. Um, and I think that that trick, we haven't felt that trickle down effect yet. You know, some of that may be due to the fact that, you know, you had the CARES Act, you had $2 trillion from the federal government that's still, you know, not all of that has been spent. The Federal Reserve has held back, I think, for, for you know, this point of, we still don't know what the fall and the winter look like. So there, there is, you know, hope, some hope, but I do think that we, we have, um, a changed economy for a while. I think that, you know, from the workforce development perspective, what that means is we have a much more direct way to really show our value and show what we do and how it can, you know, really further this economic recovery as we continue to dig out. I mean, you know, pick your economist. I think everyone's assuming we're going to have you know, much higher sustained unemployment than the three and a half percent or whatever it was, you know, back at the beginning of the year. Um, so that's a much different environment for, you know, those folks here that work within the system, but then also those employers and those those job seekers have been used to over the last, you know, couple of years. Okay, thanks, Chris. Chad, same question. Mary Sue, I kind of forget the original question here. <laughs> So from your perspective, what long-term impacts do you see the COVID crisis having on both the economy and workforce development? Yeah, I think we're kind of still working uh, week to week right now. Um, and, and I mean, as Chris and Peter have talked about, uh, the, the political pre, pre, uh, prediction, uh, pre, the predictions of what, the political stability right now in, in, the, in the country um, you know, kind of all rest on this presidential election and, and nothing is going to get solved until then for sure. Uh, and then we have two variables. We have flu season and COVID-19 uh, colliding at the same time in November, December. We've obviously seen these projections of, of, of potentially more death, uh, of basically double the number of people in the country uh, dying between now and Christmas. Um, and, and so that there's a whole host of things we just do not know. Uh, and some of this is going to be kind of dictated by behavior of people and such. 
uh, if we, and at the same time, uh, long term, I, I, I'm also in the camp that, that, that this has definitely changed the economy. It's changing habits for people in so many different ways right now. I mean, just look at schools. I know people who are moving school districts for their kids uh, based on what's being offered, um, uh, in-person, virtual. Um, and, and these are decisions that you don't make lightly uh, in your family, in your in your life. I know people, there's uprooting and moving. Or le- I mean, the trend we had before COVID of people moving back to urban areas could be threatened by this. Uh, we haven't really got to that yet. Um uh, or, or really uh, drill them. But I mean, um, I, I use Quicken Loans as this example uh, one more time. We have 19,000 employees in you know, work downtown Detroit. Um, that company uh, closed more mortgages in March than ever before. And in April, they broke that record. And in May, they broke that record. And then they sold just a piece, a tiny portion of the, of the business for a couple billion dollars um, in, in Dan Gilbert's pocket. Um, uh, uh, last month, they they've making they're making more money than ever with everybody in their basement uh, selling mortgages. I mean, they just and I mean Gilbert, he's sitting on meanwhile he's sitting on three million square feet of downtown Detroit office space, um, and I'm not certain it's ever going to be filled the same way. At least uh, uh, in, in in the next year or two or three, uh, for sure. So that changes. That changes the dynamic of, of the urban economy uh, completely. Uh, you know, you just have a whole host of service industry businesses that are not going to come back, uh, who, that can't be sustained without that um, uh, high-paid white-collar worker in downtown Detroit so, or downtown Grand Rapids or downtown Lansing or even downtown Flint. I mean, there's uh, there's been a whole bunch of new uh, positive developments in the last several years of people repopulating uh, downtowns and urban areas. Um, and COVID is, has potential to really scare some of that off. Um, and we all have seen, probably also heard about, um, it's, I mean, if, you, if you're familiar with the Northern Michigan real estate scene, apparently if you have a house on Lake Michigan, it's, it's going selling pretty well these days. Um, people are uh, re- retreating to, to um, you know, and, and they're coming out of the cities. They're leaving New York. They're leaving Chicago, um, and because they figured out they can just do all of this from home. Um, I, my brother-in-law is a researcher at UNC Chapel Hill. He just relocated back to Ann Arbor um, because he was like, "I don't need to stay here," um, and and um, and they're letting him do it. And, and employers are letting people do this if they can depend on these workers. And so it is. It is scrambling um, all of the equations that. Uh, that go into real estate and uh, the service industry um, uh, and all the different investments those businesses make based on where people work and live. Um, and so I, um, like I said, I think, I think we're week to week, month to month at best right now. Um, and, and, and after, you know, after January 1st, it's going to kind of depend on who's, who's in power and who's got or what direction they want to take the country and state. Thanks, Jen. Thank you all for your insightful answers. And yes, I definitely can relate to Northern Michigan real estate right now, since I live in Northern Michigan. Before we went through the whole crisis of, you know, everyone leaving and selling their properties, now we can't, um, there's nothing for sale. So it's uh, definitely uh, the only mainstay is change at this point. So we did have a couple of questions in the chat, Um, one from Joe. So I don't know who wants to take this one. How do we encourage the segment of workers most affected by COVID to participate in training, switch careers with more viable long-term career prospects, retail workers, for example? I don't know, Chris, you kind of touched on that a little bit with that. Did you? Right. Yeah, and I, I think you know, Joe, that's that's a critical question, right? And especially you know, in the in the retail segment, you know, and again, a general statement is that's typically you know, low wage, low skill type of work, you know, which doesn't necessarily tack on to, you know, the work that we're doing in terms of career pathways. And I think a lot of it has to do with getting, you know, getting much more of some of those um, good news stories that chat was talking about in terms of what, what are the, the, the business trends in that specific area? Who is hiring? What do those jobs look like? I mean, a lot of the times we talk about, you know, uh, we call it reaching up the pipeline to like, you know, 
uh, let middle school kids know about various jobs and things and companies in their respective areas so that they learn it from a, a, a young age. But now you've got a situation where you've got a lot of adults out there that may have been doing these jobs for a long time, acquired some skills. How do we help them, um, you know, whether it is gain new or kind of you know, adapt those skills that they have used? I, I One of the um, things I heard early on in this with respect to, say, contact tracing, uh, which I know is a big deal in terms of kind of seeing our way through and, and getting out of this situation. Um, and, and obviously, a lot of that's driven by, you know, the state and local governments. Um, initially, some of the targets for those positions were, you know, perhaps laid off retail and restaurant workers who who maybe had like a customer service focus, which is a big part of the, you know, the contact tracing application. And then you're able to kind of, so you take the customer service piece, maybe you have that from a previous position, but then you're able to, you know, learn some of the healthcare aspects and then once that contact tracing position, you know, maybe that's a transitional job for you, then you can get into something in the healthcare industry that, that Chad was talking about. Um, I think I think a lot of it just has to do with getting it. I know we've seen um, some of the things in the chat, but just talking to folks around the around the state, virtual job fairs, get it, getting the getting the word back out to people. Because I think that you know, look, the reality is we've all kind of been locked away for a little while, and you can kind of get down on your down on yourself and down on your prospects. But if you you know, if you scratch the surface and look around, see what's happening, there are opportunities there. Um, you know, again, in terms of the, those that are most affected, you know, I, I would hate to be in the situation, somebody who's again, trying to, maybe they're drawing on unemployment, the, obviously the, the, the additional federal money, the $600 had gone away. There's been a little bit of a, a backfill there with, with the Trump executive order on the $300, but that's a very limited finite, you know, six week increase. Um, but trying to help people understand that, and again, we've done this with the policymakers. Our position is not necessarily unemployment, it's reemployment, getting people back into the, and, and the reality is the longer that one person and then a segment of people are disconnected from the economy, the much more difficult it becomes, that becomes long-term unemployment, that becomes much more difficult to get that person reemployed. Um, so uh, I think it's incumbent on all of us, you know, as a, as a system, stakeholders, whether it's just education, training providers, also from the workforce side, really letting people know what those opportunities are, because I think that there is perhaps a, a false notion that employers aren't hiring. Well, as, as Chad pointed out, they are. I mean, on the workforce side, we know that people were hiring through this pandemic, right? Even when people were were kind of um, quarantined at home. So getting, getting that message out, I think is critical. Um, working directly with the employer, you know, the employers to help them reach the people that are now, you know, they have a much bigger talent pool now to reach them more directly is, you know, critical to, to getting this recovery going. Thank you for that plug. Um, we are the reemployment agency. We've been so on unemployment, everyone's gone back to, oh, we're the unemployment agency. Um, so that's great. We definitely want to reemploy. Um, Peter or Chad, did you want to comment on that um, question? Sure, 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 I'll go first, Jeff, if that's okay. Um, technology, right? I think, you know, in addition to the, the greater engagement on the reemployment side from unemployment, there's got to be a greater engagement on, on technology, right? My, my dentist office tells me when I have a, an appointment coming up via text. What are we using artificial intelligence through the unemployment uh, insurance agency to ensure that these retail employees, uh, retail former retail employees, those in the unemployment system now, are getting fully engaged with the system, right? Online job fairs are, are great, but we have disconnected systems that operate in silos in many respects. And one of the things that we've got to be able to do in a more meaningful way is utilize the technology, particularly artificial intelligence, that helps drive messages to those individuals so that they are aware, exactly as Chris described, are they aware of how they can scratch the surface? And I think that's going to be one of the, the biggest things that we're going to uh, probably have to do as a result of, of COVID and then right, what I would characterize as the surge on the unemployment system that showed all of the cracks and deficiencies in that system and how going forward we're going to have to make sure that system has 
I, it'll never have state-of-the-art technology, right? It's a government system, but it needs to have modern technology that that is that is um, uh, connected with the other silos within the, the unemployment and reemployment system to make sure those those recipients and beneficiaries are able to pull themselves out of that situation and into the new job. I will, I will follow up on, on Peter's comments about the unemployment system. I, I think we've learned that we need to re, re, totally blow this thing up and rebuild it. Uh, I mean, it is wholly insufficient for uh, modern technology, modern, and, and I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in March and April on the phone with literally dozens of unemployed uh, workers so, uh, taking down, documenting some of their problems. I wrote a big piece about just featuring a bunch of them. Uh, and then I can just continue to get phone calls uh, for, for months. I mean, I just last month or a couple of weeks ago, someone was texting me from St. John's or some uh, part of the state asking for assistance. Like I've got the keys to the UIA. Uh, um, I've just, I just frankly been giving out Steve Gray's email address. I hope he doesn't mind. Um, but um, uh, because it is just it is just abominable how bad th this system ha has been and and how um, behind it has been and and I think uh, long term as Peter kind of mentioned we got to figure out a way that we we seamlessly put people in unemployment and we seamlessly take them out or we at the same time we say we we connect them instantly with information about jobs near their house or near where they live or the type of common fields that they were working in before. Um, and that, that seems like, um, a, 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 it seems like something that can be, can be accomplished in this era of big data. And another data thing that I'm really kind of um, uh, on, on a hot streak about right now is, is, um, is, is our tr public uh, health information. We've, this this whole crisis has exposed just how vulnerable we were as a as a state and country about our own understanding of, of public health and infectious diseases, because it, it is and it's important because it affects how we can get to work every day, or how we can just go about doing uh, just normal tasks in life. Um, and right now we see a lot of struggle um, in schools and particularly colleges and universities and just being able to tell us how many cases of COVID are there active in your community that you've got tested? How many people are getting tested? What's the positivity rate? I mean, just some just some basic stuff the state itself has, has struggled with, 45 different local health departments. And then you've got all these other layers of entities like schools and colleges, community colleges, uh, private colleges and, and universities. Um, hundreds of entities uh, trying to sort of make their way through this crisis right now in real time. And we have very little information about how many um, cases are coming out of that. And the same thing with employers too. We, we don't know if, if, uh, if an Amazon warehouse has got a bout break right now, unless, unless some kind of information leaks, it's just really kind of can contained and and this information is really really important for people in trying to make decisions and get informed about this so they can figure out how to go about their lives and i, I think as a state we've got it we've got to focus on both these big huge kind of data related projects in unemployment and public health information thanks chad and i totally agree with both of you that it's a you know you don't know your cracks in your system until something like this happens and so the only other question I have, and I think it's mostly for Chris, it's from Robert. Uh, who are the main players in Congress on the labor and ec education committees in both house, in both houses that will drive change in the future? And how will the upcoming election affect these committees? Right, so the, there, there will be a little bit of change, especially on the Senate side, depending on the, the outcome of the election. I can start on the house side you know, the, the chair and the, the chairman of the committee is Bobby Scott from Virginia. Um, assuming that the Democrats hold the House, he will remain the chair. I would also say from a Michigan perspective, Andy Levin is a key member of that committee. He was actually named vice chair of the committee. You know, we at Michigan Works obviously have a, a good relationship with, with the congressman in his office. We work with them on a number of different things. Um, so I would just say, obviously, you've got Bobby Scott. 
uh, as, as who will remain as chair, assuming the, the Democrats hold the House. But Andy Levin is, is a critical voice, um, not only on that committee, but it, within the, the Democratic conference on these workforce education type issues, given his, his history in the state. Um, and then on the, on, the, on the Republican side, Virginia Fox from North Carolina had been the chair um, in, in 2016, is now the ranking member and, and would expect that to, to remain the same. On the Senate side, you know, as I mentioned, control of the Senate is, is, a, is in play for sure. Um, if the Democrats, no matter if the Democrats take control or in the minority, Patty Murray, who's been a longtime champion of, of, of this system, and, and we've, we've got a, a great relationship with her, and, and certainly she works well with Senator Sabinow and, and Senator Peters as well, she'll either be chair or ranking for the Democrats. On the Republican side, Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, a uh, longtime chair of the committee, is, um, is retiring. So he will be leaving, and that leaves kind of a, a, a big hole on the Republican side in the Senate, um, whether it's the chair or the ranking member, because there are several other senior members of that committee on the help committee in the Senate that are either retiring um, or have other committee posts uh, or are in competitive races. And so we really don't know exactly uh who and again the, the the outcome of the election will dictate, but we don't know who the the main Senate Republican voice will be um, on the on the help committee. Uh, you know, if it were just like a, a straight line thing, and some of the you know some members retired, some members lost. I think the next member with seniority is either Richard Burr uh, from North Carolina, who's um, had been chairman of the Intelligence Committee, although he's taken an absence because he's, he's being investigated um, for for some uh, insider trading related to COVID. But then you've also got Rand Paul from Kentucky, um, who you know, is, is typically seen as, um, a, a, you know, a, look, he, he was the person that voted against this recent Republican um, COVID-19 package in the Senate when they when they had their their recent vote this uh, last week. So, um, I think that's still to be unknown. Um, you know, we, we've had, as Michigan works, we've had a good relationship working with, you know, whether it's Chairman Alexander on the Senate side or Ranking Member Murray, and, and certainly Senator Stabenow is pretty well established within Senate Democratic leadership. Um, and so she gives us, you know, great insight and, and great access to, to those conversations too. Um, I would just say this too, and again, it all depends on the outcome of the election, but one of the things we've heard in recent weeks has been this idea that perhaps the Senate could could uh, do away with the filibuster. Um, that's something that that would really throw uh, an interesting wrench into to the legislative process here in DC. Obviously, in the House, as, we, as I've said many times, there's one rule, majority rules. So if you have the House majority, you can move whatever you want. Obviously, in the Senate, um, the rules have changed and, and, you know, basically you only need 50 votes for Supreme court justices, nominations, budget reconciliation, a lot of different things. There is a 60 vote, you know, de, de, and a cutoff debate threshold for legislation. Um, and that, that does hold things up considerably as you go through the process. If that were to be lowered to 50 and the Democrats had control of the house, the Senate and the white house, um, that's where you could see some of these things being pushed through, without the usual, you know, bipartisan types of discussions. You know, I think back to, you know, the days of Obamacare being pushed through. You know, obviously you had the Trump tax cuts in 2017. These largely partisan vehicles typically, you know, come through with a lot of scrutiny and criticism. And then it's much more difficult to actually fix those things because the other party feels like they were left out. Um, so there's a few different you know, mechanical issues that could come depending on the outcome of the election. But for the most part, the, the leadership will stay the same. And again, I think that the Michigan imprint will will also continue as well, having having folks like Andy Levin and, and Senator Stabenow um, at those higher level posts within the respective conferences. Thanks, Chris. So do any of you have any final comments you'd like to make before we wrap this up? No. Okay. I can. Well, I mean, I can. I can okay. start. I was oh, gonna let. I mean, I would just say that again, from my perspective on the federal side, um, 
look, the reality is there's been some disappointment, right, for, for this, this workforce development system. Of all the trillions of dollars, and yes, it's been trillions so far, there was $345 million for a National Dislocated Worker Grant um, program that was included in the CARES Act. That's the only dedicated workforce development funding that's out there. Obviously, as an association, as a group, we've supported proposals that would you know, greatly increase invest federal investments to the, to the workforce system through the Relaunching America's Workforce Act and some other bills. You know, unfortunately, even the HEROES Act was deficient in that federal funding. Um, and so, you know, through the association, we've been doing a lot of aggressive outreach to the delegation to help them again. To, and again, I, I go back to the point, this is a moment for workforce development. When, when the economy was really strong, I think perhaps people thought about it less. Um, now we have a moment where it's, it's going to be in the spotlight as we come through the economic recovery. So, um, making sure that, that we're getting those stories out there, those, um, whether it's on the policy side or just as Chad mentioned, some of those um, positive stories say people are hiring. There are opportunities for you. If you've been laid off, if you're in one of these sectors that, you know, whether your company didn't come back, whether your job was temporary or then permanently laid off, we can help you um, get reconnected to this economy because there will be opportunities as, as, as Chad mentioned. And, and um, you know, making sure that, that we through the, the Michigan work system can be part of that, connection, I think it's critical, you know, not only on the state side, but also the federal side moving forward, whether it's through funding or whether it's through, you know, WIOA reauthorization, um, you know, concepts and, and things that are that are being looked at right now. So um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to, to be with Peter and Chad and you and Mary Sue, and, and hopefully we can continue the conversation because as you said, I think I don't think the impacts from this are going away anytime soon. Chris, Peter, did you have any final comments? Hopefully, answer sure. us out. Sure. So, uh, one 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 comment, uh, a really question is, who if Joe Biden is elected president, which Democratic politicians from Michigan are still in Michigan? Right? Does Mayor Duggan go to D.C.? Does Gretchen Whitmer go to D.C.? So, I think we could see a, a vacuum, sucking sound of the Democratic political establishment from Michigan should Joe Biden get elected. And I think that will make 21-22 a very interesting place, uh, Michigan a very interesting place to watch politics. Well, to, to Peter's point, I'll make my, I, I, I kind of got out of the prediction business in 2016, but um, uh, I've been sort of uh, um, spreading around the idea that Mike Duggan could be Joe Biden's chief of staff. Um, uh, he's, he's as, as uh, organized and outsider as you could probably ask for. And, uh, and, and Joe Biden's going to need someone not from uh, Joe Biden's um, past, essentially, um, or, or, you know, old crew from D.C. Uh, to come in and help, uh, help things. But um, so for one last kind of uh, point, uh, I, I talked to a lot of associations as, as a journalist in Lansing and Detroit, uh, and one thing I've uh, always kind of emphasized that uh, if you're out talking to legislators, uh, if you're just talking to legislators on the labor economic development committees in the appropriations committees and, and the various policy committees, uh, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you, you, you need to go out and talk to other members uh, outside of the bubble of the, of the 15 or 20 people that you uh, normally just talk to. And engage them on these on these issues um, because otherwise they just are not going to be engaged on them. And when it comes to vote on your issue or or put your amendment uh, through, um, uh, there will be less you know reason to care for it. Um, I I, I kind of learned about this once um, a long time ago. Um, I heard a, a, a lobbyist for for a university so who will remain not uh, nameless, uh, who was just talking about how he just cared about. Um, the people on the, on the appropriations committee and and didn't even know about this one guy who was running the uh, representative was running for a senate seat in the thumb and i thought well maybe you ought to get to know that guy because that guy actually could cast a vote for you someday on your issue so um that's just my little two cents i don't I'm, that's about all i know about lobbying it's just you know relationships actually do matter and you ought to get out and, and talk to other people thanks chad and what a great panel so i'm right at 11:15, so we'll wrap this up Luann will give me the hook. 
Um, I just want to thank the panelists, you guys, Chad, Peter, Chris, did an excellent job. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to have this discussion. And we hope that everyone who joined found it as informative as I did. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Mary Sue. And thank you to all the panelists. We've got a short little break and then we're coming back on our main stage for our keynote speaker, Paul Artelli. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Please fill out the survey. Thanks guys.